Good evening. Welcome to the MLA Sheep Productivity and Profitability webinar series. Tonight's webinar is focusing specifically on the drivers of winter pasture growth. For those who are new to the webinar platform, this control panel will be on your right hand side. You can collapse and reinstate that control panel with a red button. You should be able to hear us, but we can't hear you. Any questions that you have, please type them in the box. We'll address them in chronological order at the end of the webinar. Now, when you are typing those questions in, please be as uh, legible as you, as you can. Um, if there's detail required, then put that detail in there, but make sure it's easy to read um, so our deliverer tonight can, can interpret and, and answer them as best he can. Just a quick word about next week's webinar, or well, excuse me, sorry, our next webinar. Uh, it's, it's going to be an excellent webinar as well. We're going to be looking at uh, the production outcomes of the uh, MLA Lifetime Maternal U program with Andrew Thompson, who operates out of, uh, I think, out of Murdoch University in Western Australia. Uh, so we have a tentative date booked in for July 4. So that's not actually next week, it's the week following. Uh, that should be a great webinar, uh, highlighting some uh, really robust uh, outcomes from some extensive research uh, in this space of the effect of new, new nutrition on, on in prime lamb flocks and and uh, what that means for our production outcomes. And they are still modelling the economic outcomes, but I don't think they'll be available uh, in time for that webinar. But there'll be enough to digest, irrespective. Just before we go on, I'll, I'll quickly share uh, the poll that we just had. Uh, thanks for participating in that. It seems as though a majority of the audience uh, has, their, has their tough times still in front of them. Um, uh, looking at early July and uh, late July, some have already passed, whereas August is interestingly also a um, uh, seeming to be a pressure point for a lot of you uh, coming up. So thanks for participating in that and you know, we'll provide some food for thought as we progress through this webinar. I'd like to introduce our presenter this evening, uh, Phil Graham of Graham Advisory. Phil's one of the best resourced industry personnel that we, we could have to deliver this webinar. Uh, Phil's a very direct and pragmatic approach to, to extension and often um, makes this ambiguous space of partial science quite clear and understandable and, and uh, has a wealth of knowledge to offer thanks to a long career working with producers and researching uh, how producers can uh, get the most from their pastures. Uh, Phil co-developed the CSIRO's Five Easy Steps Fertiliser Program. I know I've used that in the past and Phil's also been the overseer of a long-term uh, grazing fertiliser trial bookham in New South Wales among a lot of other research oriented and uh, extension consultancy services that he's provided over a, a long career. So Phil's very well resourced and we're very glad to have him on board this evening and with that I'll swap screens uh, so Phil can be the presenter. Yeah. Good evening Phil, are you there? I am Dave and um, thank you very much for kind words and um, good evening ladies and gentlemen. Um, I just want to sort of set the time for what I'm going to talk about tonight, and as you can see up there, uh, I think we've got planning windows we need to look at, and Dave's little survey helped me. What I'm really going to focus on is producers who sort of right now have only got four or five hundred kilograms of dry matter in their paddock. So for those maybe in Western Victoria who were trying to use food, whatever numbers I put up, you add 300 to it. Those who have done progress, you just take the numbers as you see them. So what's sort of 
400 kilos of dry metal look like if you're standing looking into the past you're going to see 25-30% bare dirt um, and the tallest green material only be one centimetre high at, at best and a lot will be less than that sort of past you to see two weeks after a break. I think we've got a couple of periods and it's, it's one of these cases where we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves so to me uh, critical window number one is, is up to landing. The comment there um, from some work I've just done you know every one percent um, death in the prime lamb system at presence chewing up about four and a half percent of operating profit. Um, so what we've really got to do is make sure we, we're fluting those use well enough that we stop preg tox occurring and some of the other related things. Animals will go down and it's very hard to say it was purely preg tox. It, it, it ends up being a conglomerate, but it's certainly been occurring. Once you get over that window, I then think you then concentrate on sort of the first six weeks of lambing where if you put supplements in, you're going to increase milk production, you're going to increase lactation length, so you get a payback. After that, it starts becoming a bit questionable. And for those, there's, there's a few there who have indicated they may be been through the worst. Um, you know, if, if lactation has been compromised pretty badly by the season, um, the use of creep feeding or early weaning at, uh, from eight weeks onwards um, could well be something that those flocks want to look about. And maybe that's the sort of thing we can pick up in questions because I won't really be dealing with that in the talk. So what can we do to lift pasture production? Um, the first point is absolutely critical. The next month, we are in the lowest period of pasture growth rate for everyone who's on the, uh, the hook up tonight, mainly due to temperature and day length. And um, temperature is going to be influenced by altitude. So some of the things I've, I've done lower down, I've, I've sort of used altitude as the, as the guides, because that might help a wide range of people get a sense of where they sit. And as we go further south, um, day length becomes the problem. So if we're trying to find the, the sort of little spot where's, where you're, it's most likely going to be the worst, it'll be in the Midlands of Tasmania because you've got altitude and you're on the way south. So there are things we can do. If by resting paddocks we increase leaf area index, we will increase growth rate. So think of all that green leaf as just a solar panel. If, if sun's falling on the ground, uh, potential growth has gone. So they're, they're increasing the leaf area, catching more sunlight will improve growth rate. And if we combine that with nitrogen and gibberellic acids, um, we can we can move ourselves to a, a higher level. But the critical thing is all we're doing is magnifying off a low base. So if we if we if we're resting paddocks and we're putting nitrogen and we're using gibberellic acid, we are not going to turn low winter productions into spring growth rates. It doesn't occur. We just add 10 or 15 percent on what is already there. Um, now I think uh, there was a webinar a few months ago um, which was very good on that whole nitrogen gibberellic acid so you might want to refer back to that if you want more details. The other thing I then just did from sort of experience is look at what sort of growth rates are maybe possible over the next month and you see there I'm assuming we're talking about a decent pasture and do some fertility. Like if the, if the underlying fertility of, of the, the paddocks are, are, are pretty low, you can virtually halve the numbers I've got down below. So as I said, to try and put some relevance into the wide variety of people, different areas that are represented tonight, you know, if we're above 800 metres, growth rate over the next month could be in the range of three to seven, depending on um, what the actual altitude is. Um, depending on, on how the property lays. Once you get up to that altitude this time of year, um, aspect has a, a big impact on what growth rate you can achieve. When you come down at pegging, so we, we push up to eight to 12, then we get into the cropping areas and then the pastures are maybe 12 to 18, whereas the grazing crops could be 20 to 30 and the grazing crops is most likely very dependent in this year is, is when you got them in. And I've certainly seen some grazing crops of late, but the lucky and got early rain who are most likely doing 40 kilos a day. So the, 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 the people are in areas where you've got a high growth rate because you've got to get location. If you start implementing some of those things in point number two, your payback is going to be much greater because your inherent growth rate's higher. Whereas if you're the group number one above 800 metres, um, yes, using those things in line in point two will assist your growth, but it's not going to be massive. You know, you're, you're really being squeezed by 
um, coverage and dialing. Just a couple of issues I think you need to consider about um, the two products, GA up the top's just gibberellic acid. Um, you know, the sort of where I was focusing the talk tonight, we're talking about pastures with very low leaf area. So um, there's no doubt about it that the, the amount of leaf area you've got before you put the gibberellic acid it, it has, a, it has a big influence on the sort of benefits. So there's some paddocks um, where the benefits are going to be too, too crucial just because you haven't got a plant material. But one thing we shouldn't overlook is that the jib will in fact increase pasture height. And if things are really tight, tight for twin bearing ewes, if you get an extra centimetre on the height of the pasture, even if her herbage mass doesn't change, that's quite a critical thing to therefore the intake of the twins and how they're going to get through a difficult period. They're going to eat more, so the pads, you're going to go through it quicker, but it, it, it does help you turn a difficult situation into something that's maybe a little bit better. And the majority of you of, of people around Australia that I sort of hear and talk to is that really, you know, it's best to use tube with nitrogen. When we come to the nitrogen story, um, we've, of course, we've had that dry period. There will have been good mineralisation been in the soil. So I think you want to be a bit careful on, on, on what paddocks you pick. Um, I must admit, from my experience over the years, I've tended to get a bit of payback of in when they've gone into paddocks that are grass dominant and haven't. They haven't been that great. Um, and the important thing there is you've got to remember that a vast majority of time you put in on a pasture, you're going to improve pasture digestibility a bit. And if you get a two or three percent improvement in digestibility, that is almost as big a value as if you've grown an extra 300 kilos. And the paddocks where you'll have the biggest impact in digestibility are those ones that have got good grass, poor, poor. Um, clover and, and haven't been doing that well. So I guess, don't necessarily go out and choose my best paddocks to put in on, which is not necessarily a view that's, that is accepted, but that's been my experience. Just as a, as a rule of thumb for people, you know, it's sort of a seed, you'll grow about an extra 10 kilograms of dry matter for every one unit of end you put on, nitrogen. Also the other thing is we've just got to be a bit careful about if you put a lot of in out, there is, the, is chances of nitrate poisoning. It doesn't happen all the time. I've got away with doing it without risking, but sort of again, a rule of thumb there is one day's rest for every unit of N. So if you put 30 units of N on a paddock, um, you're really looking at on the basis of shutting up from, it's been shut up for a month before you stock it. And that tends to make sense because you really got to let that leaf area get the plant going from the end to really um, give you the full impact. Now just trying to look into the future a bit with some fodder budgets. Um, and again, I'm starting sort of in the middle of June, assuming that there's 400 kilos in the paddock. Again, I've done it for three, um, like, you know, altitudes. The first column you'll see, that's the, excuse me, herbage mass in the paddock, let's say mid-July where we haven't done anything, right? The pad, we've shut the paddock up. So between now and mid-July, we're not grazing and, and that's the herbage mass. Everything started off at 400, but there's a herbage mass as we might be at by the middle of July. Now the next column, which um, is in blue, again, it's mid-July, but in this case, we might have taken early on some action in terms of, of putting some in out and putting some jib acid out as well. And we've made an improvement now, people could certainly put up cases where the improvement could be more or less than that, but I think they're sort of fairly robust figures. So if you're in that cropping environment, you, you've done that, and you get to mid-July, the herbage mass of 1,000 kilos in the paddock, you get a grin on your face and, and leave, and you can you know, head off to what, what, what would end up being not an atypical lambing. Um, the other two figures, uh, the 600, Hopefully the people above 800 metres aren't planning to lamb in mid-July in that sort of environment because they're in trouble. Uh, yeah, 800, you get into a point where you're happily land singles. Oh, geez, you can get away with twins without the wheels totally falling off, but you need to be a bit careful. And then we, we go through again, we, the mid-August, the third, third uh, column across, that's if we're doing nothing. So that's just allowing the growth to come through. And if I look at the area where I sit at Yas, where we're sitting in that um, 
600 metre altitude by mid August, we've got a thousand and, and potentially the year, this, you know, which is a pretty common landing time, things are sitting okay. And if you if we go to a bit more effort, um, we're certainly reaching figures and the higher country, which would normally most likely be looking at landing dates in late August, they so potentially are getting numbers where things are starting to look okay. So it's anyone who's landing sort of, I think August has has a chance of, of pulling things around. It's really the people who are into it you know, very soon who are still looking at numbers, which would be difficult. Now, that's all achieved by the fact we've got a paddock shut up. So if, if, if nothing's grazing, we've got to have a stock somewhere. So what I've done here is look at um, two groups of animals. So at the top, we've got sort of crossbred ewes, and I'm sort of saying that these crossbred ewes, um, uh, not pregnant, fat school through at about 75 kilos, so it gives you some idea of the size. At present, with twins in them, they're going to be up in the high 80s, and 60 kilos merino ewes, which might have terminal cross progeny. Now, to try and give some relevance to people across a wider spectrum, Instead of describing the pasture in kilograms of dry matter, I've just tried to describe it in height because when we're in a tight situation, height's the most, most critical thing. So our pastures, um, if we've started off late, our pastures aren't going to have density in them and for most likely another six weeks. So it's the height of the pasture that becomes critical. So you can read the numbers there and you can refer to these later on yourself. But for this crossbred ewe who's twinning and is get going in the last month of pregnancy on, 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 a, on a pasture that's one centimetre high, if we're going to feed them such that we're ensuring we're not going to have prep tots, we're looking in the order of 850 grams per head per day of a cereal type thing. Now, that feeding rate does not totally stop weight loss, but it brings weight loss back in the realms where the animal should not fall over. As the pasture jumps in height, that goes from you know, the 850 down to 650. And once we get to three centimetres, um, we've moved a hell of a lot away and we're in a lot more comfortable territory. You can see the figures for singles, uh, much smaller, just logically during demand. And once we go down to the merinos, it's the same principle. We've got a smaller animal. Um, and so our amounts just drop away and, and if we get down to the singles in those merino ewes, things are looking okay. So hopefully that gives people a bit of a guide. And if you remember the comment I made earlier, if, if, if jib acid does nothing more than move up your pasture from one centimetres to two centimetres, it does have some influence in intake um, that you need to hold those animals. But bear in mind, if all it's done is increase height, you're still going to chew through the paddock. Um, pretty quick because it's made it more available for the stock to consume. Uh, Dave and I were talking this afternoon and he asked me about well, what's the situation, that's a, that, uh, well, what's the scenario in, in, if we've got a paddock that's being grazed at present, um, you know, how might that hold up? Is it going to grow away from our stock or what? So I went in and looked again, if we go back to the 75 kilo you even on 400 kilos, being fed the sort of numbers that was on the last page, but it doesn't matter whether we're talking about a single or twin year, it's very simple. Um, they can still harvest about 1.1 kilograms of dry matter per day from that pasture. So if we if we sort of look in, uh, in you know, let's say the high country, but if you've got, well, it doesn't matter where you are, if you've got a growth rate of five kilos a day, then four years per hectare is basically going to eat that growth and the paddock's not going to change. Uh, if we've got growth around the eight figure, well then seven years are going to pull it up. That's really not until we get to growth rates in the order of 15 kilos, where we'll get a stock paddock that's going to be moving away to stock to any degree. Um, and the first benefit you're going to see there is not necessarily the paddock changing, you'll just start noticing the stock are not cleaning up the grain. So the, the first benefit comes if you can get away feeding less um, because the paddock's starting to move away from the animals. And I think that's very important when you are food to pay attention to just what's happening. And, and if the grain's not being consumed, you then use your common sense and um, reduce it back. Because remember, when we assess a pasture, what we are seeing is what's left after the stock have consumed it. 
we don't actually see what was there before they eat it. So stock can in fact do better than in conditions like this, better than what we think because of they're getting a bit more than what we see. And I think that little example in front of it just highlights the problem uh, for, for people. It's, it's those people in, the, in uh, maybe the higher country um, where growth rate is going to be slower. So it's either it's growth rate slower either because of altitude or growth rate slower because of, of where you sit in the landscape. So you're further south or you might be, you know, in, in the Western districts and a lot of, a lot of cloudy weather, which can certainly knock growth rate back a bit. The, they're the areas which unfortunately there's not gonna be a radical change over the next six weeks in terms of herbage mass. You know, the, the late break has, um, has sort of pinched us in there and, and we're just going to have to deal with it. Um, there's no magical solution, but as soon as we get away down into the mixed farming zones where, where growth rates are sort of 15 kilos a day, yes, I can see paddocks um, moving away from them. And it just depends a bit where you're sat. If you've got, you know, 10 or 15 mils earlier than someone else, you could be travelling quite comfortably. Um, I can see 20 kilometres apart, you can move from people who are in a very comfortable situation and got the ability to buy trading stock to people who are really struggling. So it, it, it's been passion rainfall, it just depends where you sit. Um, now, bearing in mind that the scenario I've been talking about, in a number of those cases, we, we're, gonna, we're gonna flirt to make sure that we get use through the peg tox window. That's the critical thing. We've got to have the animals alive. If we lose the ewe, we lose the lamb. If, if the lamb's on the ground, the ewe's alive. If, the, if lactation doesn't end up being brilliant, the penalty to us is we're not, we don't win the best lambs, but we've still got them on the place and we can still play catch up later on. We, are, we, still, we have people who are going to have to continue feeding into lambing. It's just, there's just no way around it. You know, you, you just can't stop when the first lambs drop because there's still a heap of um, late pregnant ewes you've got to protect. So a lot of people are going to have to feed. Is there, is there a magical way of feeding without causing um, mismothering? No, there's not. It's a case of minimising the losses. The two methods that are available, you're using feeders. Uh, a couple of critical things with food is it needs to be a food where you can control the sheep's intake so it's got some sliding mechanism. You know, there's less time in the lambing paddock because of that. But if we don't get the number of feeders per the use correct, it's my view you are better to trail feed than, than put feeders in the paddock and have too few. So I think. Um, once you get above about 220 lactating years on a feeder, the problems start increasing once you go above that. And if, you, if you're trying to use a feeder for 400, um, you can have major issues. Um, one thing that certainly occurs in, in maybe some of the high country, the weather we had last weekend where we had some um, pretty difficult weather blow through, and it's not the fact of what it's like for the day, it's what it's like in that three or six hour period when the worst of the front comes through, they'll basically stop eating in that period. And once the weather finds, they can suddenly go charging back because they're a bit hungry in the food. It's normally they just work themselves casually so they everyone gets a chance. If something stops them and they all go back at a rush, you can get these smothering events um, under fluters, which I think certainly in areas prone to bad weather, which is principally rain and wind, you just need to be aware of that. So I have had experience over time when that became such an issue that some people um, moved away from the food because it's just something they're having trouble managing. If we go to trial feeding, there's no doubt about it, you get a better control over the amount, provided you know how much you're feeding out. Uh, in years like this, you really do need, if, if the animals need, I put numbers up before, you know, if they need 800 grams a day, you need to be confident you're somewhere around there. It's not much point saying, oh, I've got no idea, I just put some out and, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, there's no doubt about it, if you're trail feeding, there is a greater disturbance to lambing and potential losses, but I think it comes back to how it's done. We know people who will do it and do not have many problems. Yeah, it's got to be done quietly. And to some degree, you may be 
it's maybe going to depend on how you over all your time of, of, of manage your stock and, and um, how you work with your stock, what your dogs are like, how hard you push them. Um, in my time over the years, I've seen some sheep which are very flighty, mostly driven more by the um, the owners and management of them. Um, and other people have got really quiet sheep. If you're super really flighty and you're, you're going into trail 30, you're going to have more trouble if you've got um, quiet sheep because they're to manage them. The only one thing I can say to people there is Peter Halstead Carer Research Station oh, 10 or 15 years ago uh, did some work and, and Peter came up with that if you do have to go in the paddocks during lambing and food, if you can sort of do it in that, you know, 12 o'clock to 2 o'clock window, um, you will minimise disturbance. It is not to say you will stop disturbance, it just means you minimise disturbance. So, and if, if it has broken up, you've allowed a period of time for the ewe and lamb to bond back together before nightfall. So um, that's about the only comment I can make there, but it's one of these things. Um, it is most likely more important that the ewes are fed, so we make sure we keep ewes alive than um, saying, oh, I'm not going to do it because of, of um, risk of lamb loss. That just leads me to the last point is, I think in years like this, it's absolutely critical that you don't set unrealistic targets for this lambing on yourself. Um, the late break has created the situation and no matter who you are, there are aspects this year that are beyond your control. So don't blame yourself for everything that goes wrong. And that's not to say that you don't give yourself a kick up, you know, when, when you made a mistake, but that, you know, learn from mistakes and move on. I'm seeing a lot of people uh, right now who are really um, uh, knocking themselves, I think unjust, unjustly criticising themselves for what's happened on their place when really um, they've thought about it, they've put a plan in place, they've got good information to put that plan in place, but nothing, no plan can turn a difficult year like we've got into something brilliant. And I think it's important that you just back off. Um, Talking to my mate the other day, he chose the wrong time to go and get his blood pressure checked because it was through the roof and the doctor wasn't going to let him out. Um, he got a little blood pressure meter and after he got uh, 25 mils of rain, he took his blood pressure and it's dropped considerably. Right. So, you know, just take it easy on yourself. Dave, that was the, um, the guts of the work. Mind you, look, I just remembered I made a major area, error back on this one, not an error I forgot. Up the top, I've got calcium and magnesium. If you're feeding grain, um, grain's are low in calcium, not magnesium, calcium and sodium. They're low in sodium and they're low in calcium and we need to put it out. And I've certainly seen um, problems, certainly with calcium this year. Um, it just didn't get into the diet quick enough and even though they, people were, were feeding something that had calcium in later, they had problems. Um, and where we need magnesium is if we're, if we're putting these animals on the grazing, certainly grazing weeds, we then really need magnesium. But in a pasture scenario, we certainly need calcium and we certainly need sodium when those sorts of rates of, of brains are being fed. All right, thanks, Dave. Cracking webinar. Thank you, Phil. Much appreciated. Now, I'll just give you a, a rest for. Uh, uh, two or three minutes there, Phil, uh, to gather your breath. Um, now, excellent closing words on the human aspects of feeding. I know it's a it's a drudgery and a, and a stressful uh, a stressful time for a lot of people. So keep that in mind. It's, it's it is a environmental factor that we have to deal with as farmers uh, from time to time. This one here has been exceptional. Don't forget uh, the post webinar survey. If you want to leave any ideas or uh, some feedback for MLA or, or us as uh, presenters, uh, to, then take that opportunity and the feedback. We do look at that. We do uh, consider it. We provide that to MLA and we provide that to the presenters, uh, net of your private uh, contact details. Um, as said at the start, we have a webinar coming up potentially on July 4, but you'll have more information on that closer to the date. It's going to be taking a close look at that lifetime maternal 
Uh, you work that MLA have been funding, uh, some really good research there led by a similar research team that has developed a lifetime new management course. So um, there's a, a bit of pedigree in the uh, in those who have pulled the work together and, and a great opportunity to hear some of the preliminary production results uh, with the economic um, analysis pending. Yeah, Phil's got uh, his contact details there, no doubt. He'll be available for people if they want to uh, be in touch with him about um, you know, his services and uh, and the stuff that he can help you with your business going forward. And there's a there's a few resources for this topic. Obviously, the Making More from Sheep website has got a range of um, pasture growth rate uh, data and, and estimates and um, a few a few few things like that. So make sure you jump online and have a look when you can. Uh, a good chance to take your uh, to send a few questions in. Phil's kindly offered to stay in line for as long as we need this evening uh, to answer as many questions as you can. Uh, there's some great questions coming through already and uh, keep them keep them coming. Um, make sure that you articulate them as, as well as you can and I'll make sure that Phil gets the opportunity to answer them. Um, Phil, I might uh, take the opportunity to, to, to lead with a question if that's all right. Yeah, Phil, we've been talking to some producers about the conditions uh, this particular winter and the stuff that you've presented has put it in great context. In your opinion, what uh, what would your producers be? Or no, sorry, what on average what deficit uh, uh, deficit uh, uh, or growth uh, partial growth rate deficit would a normal prime land business be operating at through midwinter if there is a deficit and what uh, and how does this uh, season um, what effect does this sort of season have on that uh, you know midwinter requirements versus pasture growth rate yeah look um, it's 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 basically herbage mess more than pasture growth rate um, whether we have a we have whether we have an early break or a late break, pasture growth rates can be the same, and it just depends what the weather does. Look, I've given I think what I think is a realistic uh, situation there. If we can crack um, uh, two or three weeks of ab abnormally good winter weather, we could easily pick up 200 kilos on those numbers I put there. Dave, I think, I think we're about, this year, I think we're about 300 kilos of herbage mass less than we would normally do. So, you know, if we're talking about, um, I was talking about sort of 400, maybe in a normal year we'd be, we'd be sitting at this stage more around 700. So I think that's the gap that the late breaks made. Yeah. Um, and then it just depends when your lambing is. If if you yeah, if you're a bit late, you've, you've got time to play a bit of catch up. It's but it's the ones who, because of their localities, um, lamb a bit earlier. They're the ones who have really been caught this year. Just out of interest, um, I did some measurements on the, the Bookham site uh, just the other day because I was interested to see what what's going on. And this is this has been shut up for about a month beforehand. But in the first 19 days of June, we grew 26 kilos of dry matter per hectare per day off a annual grass native clover pasture. Now I've never measured growth rates like that for early June before. Um, so if, if now the, the thing about the Bookham site was it got more moisture earlier, so it was up and going. Um, but you know, if we can if we can get some weather, things can change around quickly. Yeah. Okay. And is that a is those are those good partial growth rates a function of maybe no overburden, or is it just um, uh, reasonable temperatures with that early moisture? No, you've you've, you've hit it. Um, no overburden. So we haven't had uh, we haven't had a big carryover, um, and we've had we've had some favourable weather. And but also I've seen over the years if we get late breaks. Things tend to jump a bit quicker than you'd normally expect. I always make this comment that, that nature tends to play a bit of catch up. So if you've done it tough, it will, it will give you a little bit of benefit and things will kick away. Um, I forget when it was, um, maybe late 90s, early 2000s. Remember, the season broke on the 10th of June and everyone thought our throats were cut and by the end of June we were walking around saying, oh, 
this wasn't quite as bad as what we thought. So things can respond. Um, and uh, so you want to you want to keep an eye out and look at the look at your pastures and, and do some assessments there. Just get a feeling for um, what's going on, and and um, and that can therefore influence what you might do. And, and that, that comment I made before about you know keeping an eye and like cleaning up the grain because that's most likely the first you will see that before you'll see pastures move. Thanks. Yeah, hey, good comment there. Thanks, Phil. Um, look, some questions coming through here. Uh, Casey asks, um, with regards to soil temperature affecting growth, uh, what, are, what are your soil, sort of key um, key ranges in which soil temperatures start to affect different pasture types, Phil? Yeah, look, it's, it's interesting, you know, the soil, the soil temperature is a function of air temperature. So the top, top one centimetre in the soil runs at a five-day five day lag of what air temperature is doing. So it's really falling behind. So I, 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 to be honest, I don't tend to, tend to, look, at, um, tend to look at soil temperatures. Uh, the one thing we must remember that um, while soil temperature has an influence, um, if we go into country which, is, which has got low fertility and country with good fertility, even though the soil temperature is the same and the moisture is the same, we get quite, different, quite dramatically different growth rates because of fertility. Um, so uh, I don't necessarily get that carried away with soil temperature. If soil temperature is more of a player if we're trying to germinate a new pasture and different species, and then it certainly comes into play. But we've... Um, with established pastures, you know, if we look at if we look at um, yeah, 30 centimetres down, the soil's most likely going to be four or five degrees warmer than it is on the top. That's the sort of numbers that we see on the southern tablelands at present with our soil moisture probes and temperature figures. So the plant roots steeper down are at, at uh, they could be in a soil temperature of 14 degrees, even though the surface temperature might only be back at seven. So. Yeah, I don't get I don't get hung up. I sort of look at it's to me it's more driven by what our daily our days temperatures are like and and um, how many hours of sunshine we're getting. You know, we're getting good lot of lot of sunshine, or is it when our day length's short? If we get a hell of a lot of really thick, heavy cloud, that'll knock growth rate more than uh, soil temperature. Soil temperature could go up, the growth rate will go back. Okay, okay, interesting. Thank you, Phil. Um, Question here from Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Ryan just referred to a comment, um, you know, stipulating that once pastures get above about 15, uh, 15 kilos a day in growth rate, then, then the paddocks will start to move away from the stock. Uh, Ryan just wanted to, to confirm at roughly what stocking rate uh, were you referring to? Yeah, look, fair enough. Um, how long is it pretty strict? I was thinking in my mind, um, it's it's pretty unusual that people would go more than 10, uh, 10 years per hectare. So for 10 years per hectare, um, certainly 15 kilos were starting to get some growth going on top of the paddock of move. Um, so yeah. that was my thinking in, in, in saying that in saying that comment. Just as just to, as a qualifier, Phil, uh, what's what's the maximum intake for a prime lamb you uh, you know, because my thoughts are is that once the pasture can you know can really start to get uh, a go on but you still might not see it because obviously their intake just you know really jumps up as as they can get to more of it more quickly uh at what stage Dave? where in the where are the what is, is this uh pre-lambing well I, i'll say pre-lambing yes um if you're talking about big years like that and they've got twins inside them uh, those animals could easily um, chew themselves through 1.4, 1.5 kilos. Yeah, and that will increase post lambing. Oh yeah, yeah. Once we get once we get into full lactation with their twins, animals like that, their intake is going to be uh, the ewe uh, uh, and plus the lambs, etc. We'll will hit a peak intake of 3.5, 3.8 yeah, kilos. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Peak, you know. Yep. Okay, good question. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, two uh, 
two questions from Graham. I know Graham's up towards Bathurst, uh, uh, Millthorpe area there. Thanks for coming online, Graham. Um, Graham's at 800 to 1,000 metres. First question is how much leaf area to make jib acid uh, really worthwhile and what species will give the best response to jib acid? Um, I would um, I would recommend Graham look at um, Basil Basil's um, presentation from a few days ago. Look, from my from my experience with Jim, and I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm, I'll, there's be, there'll be a lot of people around who have had more experience with Jim than I have, but I think you'd want at least 700 kilos um, leaf area. Uh, you certainly want a situation where when you look down in your past, you're not seeing bare dirt. Um, species, from my experience, um, you know, our phalaricus, our ryegrasses, uh, coxfoots, those sort of um, pastures, I've seen better responses. I did work maybe 10 years ago on some native ones and we didn't, they didn't really move much, but I must admit they got put on in a pretty tough year and there wasn't much leaf area. So it might, that might have been more driven by leaf area than, than species. Mm. Thanks. Um, yeah, do, do check out uh, Basil's webinar, it's up on the Making More From Sheep website and he does provide um, dry, um, dry matter targets for the application of DNA. Another question from Graham, uh, they didn't apply this super in autumn this year but they still do, they still have their fertilizers on hand, uh, they're wondering whether they should apply the super now or should they wait until early spring? Um, if Graham could confidently tell me what conditions are like over the next two months up there, I'll give him an answer. Look, um, look if, there's been, if there's been good history of, of, of phosphorus in there, I'd most likely hold off till, till um, springtime up in that sort of um, area. Uh, if, if there wasn't good history, well then I might be willing to go, but I'd be going on on I'd be putting I'd just be putting it on some of the better paddocks. So that why why not do everything now if if you go with everything and suddenly it turns um, surprisingly really wet and waterlogged, you will get a you know slightly bigger tie up and putting into the system now isn't going to be a magical cure um, for growth in sort of the next month. Yeah, nitrogen will do something that please a longer term payback. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, just a quick question, a quick no, a quick comment from Casey. Thanks. Um, they've fed corn and lupins through a super spreader and they suggested that worked uh, during lambing and they suggested that worked pretty well. It's 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 a it's a great method, um, but it's it's dependent upon your environment and soil type. So there'd be some there'd be some environments and soil types where you just get a bit too much wastage. So the, the wetter the wetter the area and, and um, yeah, if if you can do it, it's it's a brilliant way to do it. Absolutely no question. Yeah, Ripper. Okay, um, Dale. Thanks. Is there a preferred number of twin ewes per feeder or just a few less than singles? Question. Any Anything more? To uh, yeah, look, again, it's a piece of string answer. If um, 100 twins, twins per feeder is better than 150, um, 150 is better than 200. Look, it comes back to um, uh, what have you got? And and I would rather if I'm if I'm short of feeders, I would rather put um, say uh, one to one hundred and fifty or one hundred and eighty twin bearing ewes um, and get that right. And and that might mean I've got some other twin bearing ewes where I haven't got a feeder. I'd rather get the right number in in the paddocks and and use trail feeding the others than try and say oh well, I'm just going to stretch them. The feeders across all these paddocks. Um, from my experience, doing the stretching tends to come unstuck more. Mm. Okay, thanks, Phil. Um, question here from from Alex. Thanks, Alex. Is it worth applying nitrogen 
uh, to a majority clover pasture. I think your payback would be, um, your payback's gonna be less. So from a, a straight a dollar return, um, you're not you're not going to get anywhere near the return doing that than if it was if it had grasses in it. Um, you know, even even now, um, the clovers will still be producing nitrogen themselves. They'll be keeping it for themselves, hence their dark colour. So putting more in into the system, they've already got their supply. Um, so personally, if that was my decision, I wouldn't be doing it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. Now. Um... Katie, thanks Katie. Uh, should we be mixing supplementary calcium and sodium through the grain or just offer it as a separate lick? Um, I'm totally comfortable it being offered just as a separate lick. Um, you know, I can look at the 30 odd years I've been in the game, you know, at the start of it all, so I know it's got to be mixed through and for a variety of reasons. It was really the advent of the lick feeders. Um, you don't want to put it in lick feeders because that's the best way to gum them up very quickly. Um, and people have found that they're just putting them in tubs or even dumps on the ground and it's, it's working well. Um, so I, I myself would just put them in, a, in a, a tub or a dump on the ground and I wouldn't worry about mixing it through the grain. Yeah, okay. That guess, guess the one thing if we do that, if you're using the tub and you move animals from one paddock to another paddock, the tub has to move when the stock move. You don't move the stock at five o'clock one day and go back and move the tub at nine o'clock the next morning. The stock move at five, the tub moves at five. Because if, if that's the only risk of not putting in the grain, the tub must go because certainly with calcium, it can it can hit very quickly. Okay, ready, eh? Um, a question from Rob. Rob's up at, towards Molong there. Thanks for coming along, Rob. Um, do we stop adding lime prior to lambing to avoid lazy uterus? Um, yeah, look, there's been a lot of talk about this over the years, and um, my comments in this area go back to um, I had the pleasure of working with a, a, a vet in the young PP board called John Evers. Um, tremendous vet, very experienced. Um, John's view over over a 30 year experience with a hell of a lot of sheep that um, he saw more people, he saw more problems by the calcium not being put in than, than too much or being in there for too long. So no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't back off. Um, yeah, once once the sheep are predominantly on the pasture, we can we can take the take the calcium out of the system. Um, but if I was uh, if things were really tough and the majority of the lambing used diet is coming from grain, I would still keep um, the calcium in the system. Okay, thank you. A uh, question here from Ken. Um, a great talk, Phil. No BS. Uh, <laughs> how many DST do you consider a 75 kilo first cross you with twin lambs? And would you advise some hay to go in the paddock along with supplementary uh, supplementary grain? Uh, right, I might start at the back and work to the front of the question. Um, hey, look. That's going to depend on what uh, the paddock is like. Um, if the paddock is if the paddock is is really 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 short, having some hay there, I think it's benefit it's beneficial. Um, if we're in a situation like that, then this is easy for me to say. I prefer it to be good hay than just straw. Um, Hay can play a role if, if there's um, um, some rough weather coming along, like we've just experienced, there's benefit in putting some hay there to act as a bit of a, a buffer for them. Um, as the pasture starts to get, to, to get away, 
Hay es difícil de obtener, hay es muy expensivo y en un sistema de operación de sopa obtendremos mucho más valor de nuestros dólares spent en grain y en hay. Pero si tienes algo en una situación particular, puede haber beneficios, pero no lo regalo como una prioridad alta. ¿Qué escribo en el DC rating? Oh, there you're going to be. We would have we would have crossbred animals running around now whose DSC rating is not much below three, two point eight, two point nine. Mm. If we're if we're if we're taking account of the U for the twelve months and the growth rate of the progeny to the point of weaning, which is really how we did how we did yeah. back to the sort of the That was the norm of assessing what's the DSE capacity of the year. Once once the lambs are weaned, they then become a different question. But it's her performance for 12 months plus the the, the those two progeny. The quicker they grow, the higher the rate. Um, is that a three like a 12 week weaning or a, or a, like out, are you going beyond the 12 month window on that? Oh no no no, that's the, just with being weaned at about 12 weeks. Yeah right yeah okay. Thanks Ken. Good question. Really good questions. Um, now, David asked a question uh, about soil temp. We might just skip over that. We've got a fair few questions, and um, Phil, you, you're comfortable that you've addressed soil temp appropriately? Yeah, look, yeah, it's, um, yeah I've got nothing else to say. Okay. Um, uh, Casey's got a question here. Thanks, Casey. Plenty of questions. Uh, when grain is hard to get, How do we manage the change to different types of feed? Different types of feed? Yeah, rightio. The the um, uh, if if you can you know if you can get it such that you can shandy your old feed with your new feed over a week, um, that'd be great. If if that doesn't work out and, and the way things are this year, um, that's most likely not going to work out. Um, I tend to sort of, so if I'm, if I'm feeding X grams per head per day and I've got to go on to a new feed, the first feed of it, if it is only 50% of X, um, and then I might give a couple of feeds of that and then I'll go to get up to 75% of X, another couple of feeds, and then I'm back to the rate I was at before. So that might be depending on your feeding regime, you know, it might be over, a, a, um, a week or eight days that you're going to get back to what the rate was but um i'd even or even if even if i'm feeding the same let's say i'm just feeding wheat and i get a totally new batch of wheat i must likely just drop it back to 75 straight away because even even batches can, it can be enough to to cause a few problems yeah right yeah spot on thanks phil phil i'm going to just cast ourselves across that question we received actually in advance of the webinar uh, thanks to Oliver, he's the first person out of 60 or 70 webinars that I've delivered has actually started asking the questions before we've even ran the webinar. So uh, thumbs up for proactiveness. Thanks. Uh, hi, yep. hi, Phil. I'm anticipating a very tight winter lamb in Western Victoria. I've never supplementary fed before. If I am to start, what are the key recommendations to, dis to limit disturbance and mismothering? Right, yeah. So it's, oh, we're assuming this is this is lambing, um, feeding after lambing. Um, well, I suppose the, the 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 key things I think, as I, as I mentioned about Holsey's work, of if you're going to do it, you know, do it in that midday to early afternoon. Um, do it in a in a quiet, considered manner. Um, you know, some people it's a the way their dogs work or the way they ride a motorbike. Um, some people will charge in and try and get it done um, exceptionally quick and other people will just maybe take 10 minutes longer in that paddock but do it in a bit more considered way. Um, the more you are considered and just observant of where the animals are, um, I'd sort of, you know, the old cliche, a bit of, you know, stock and shit about just noting the stock. Um, But I, I also make that comment, back up the comment I made earlier that, you know, it's a, it's a tough season, you've got to do it. And I don't want to give you the expectation there will be no mismothering. There will be some, but 
it's going to be the lesser of two evils and just accept that. Um, um, I don't think I can say there's no magical solution. Um, good dose of common sense. Um, be observed and take your time. Thanks for that question, Ollie. Phil, I just, you might be able to debunk this. I've heard someone tell me once that it's a good idea to, 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 to get your ute to make a particular noise when you are trail feeding. Um, I heard that someone put a, a, you know, rang a bell when they were trail feeding, which meant that, yes, the, the ewes would chase him like crazy when he was trail feeding, but at least the next time he came into the paddock and he wasn't ringing the bell, then there was nothing to associate distinctively with the trail feeding, so he minimised a bit of disturbance through that. Is that something you've heard before? Or? No, that's a, that's, that's a first, but um, look, animals animals learn from association. Um, there's no question about that, so I wouldn't necessarily um, say that that's, that's a load of rubbish. You know, part of me says, well, there could be some sense in that. I think, I think the critical thing is it's, it's how you it's how you've sort of handled your stock over time is really going to be the determiner of, of how big a problem you have. Um, and and someone doing that, you know, that just maybe set up that little association. I just go back to um, no names, no patrol, but we had a contractor come through the district about five years ago um, whose whose team were not that good in ter in terms of stockmanship. And the impact that had on stock, how they behaved in the paddock and how they behaved in the yards after that, this one contracting team and you could just follow them around and all the owners complained. You know, we can we can have a very negative or positive effect on stock, how we buy how we look after them, how we manage them, that, that common sense part. And I think, yeah, if you've got to do it, if you do it in a in a you know thoughtful, considerate, sensible way, you can get away without doing a disaster, but don't set your expectations that there'll be no losses. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Um, question here from Chris. Chris has been a webinar supporter for a fair while. Thanks, Chris. Uh, they're above average roo numbers seemingly this year. Uh, what, 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 are roos, what impact do roos have on your, um, your dry matter intakes and, and, you know, obviously your feed budgeting? Well, um, when I did those numbers there, I was assuming there was no roos. And if you've got... Um, if you've got massive problems, they are going to have a very, very big impact um, on your operation. And in fact, the place I was on recently, the decision that was sort of we we made after looking at the property was that the best thing that could be done for that property was that um, an organised shoot was undertaken. You know, they, they got the permission to get in and take the numbers and that was done because that was going to have a, a quicker turnaround on on this country than anything else we did. So yes, I agree. I've seen um, some of the heaviest concentrations of roos that I think I've ever seen in my working life over the last two months. Yeah. Thanks, Phil. Um, Phil, a question here from Alana. Alana's from south of Wagga, down towards Mangapa. Good to see you online, Alana. Uh, any experience with yous not grazing winter active varieties. We have a loose and partial four, four centimetres high. The lactate, lactating ewes don't appear to be touching it. Um, could we get some quick feedback of how long they've been in the paddock for? Yeah, for sure, Alana. Just um, let us know how long they've been in the paddock and any other particulars that you think may help fill with that. Alana said they've been in the paddock for two weeks and they're still not touching them, seemingly. Maybe three weeks. Hmm. No, right, yeah. Um, no, listen. Um, well, I suppose two things. Um, if it's if it's a loose and paddock, uh, after three weeks, they if they weren't eating anything, they would have gone backwards very quickly, and you would notice it. And if they if they haven't changed in their appearance, it could just be that. Um, uh, the growth rate of that paddock is in fact e equal in consumption, so you're not seeing any change. Um, uh, but the stock are consuming it. That, to me, I, I would think that is more likely than they're not eating it. Um, because otherwise, if they've been in three weeks, you would have really seen some problems now. 
maybe you have. Um, and if that's the case, just move them out. I can't answer why. Um, um, animals, animals have uh, behaviour traits that we don't understand, and um, and sometimes you just move them on. You, you bring them back in that paddock three weeks later, and they'll behave differently. That's about all I can say. Yeah, Elena, thanks you. Thanks, Elena. It's good. Good to see you online. Uh, Sam, <coughs> Sam's provided a question here, Phil. Um, it's, it's a bit long, but I'll, uh, I'll read it and we can interpret as we go. Phil, with the table showing a 75 kilo crossy, the 60 kilo merino, etc., with one and two centimetre partial heights at the top, uh, those yeah. and those things for the intake of each U, single and twin, do they show a reduced intake to satisfy demand with the addition of gib acid and nitrogen? No, so, so those, those figures in that table are the, the grams of grain you need to feed per head per day to um, achieve a satisfactory level of a safe level of performance of those animals in their last month of pregnancy. So it's the intake they require. So as herbage mass goes, as height goes up, as height goes up, their intake will go up. The requirement to achieve the same level of production in those animals, the amount of grain that goes in drops away. And then once we get to, as the, as the demand lowers because they're either singles or they're a smaller sheep, um, we get to the point where, in fact, the pasture can achieve a satisfactory level of production without anything being put in. Um, what the nitrogen and gib acid will do could enable a pasture to move from one of those categories to the category next to it. Right. And certainly, certainly with gib acid, it's, it's possible for that paddock to maybe gain an extra centimetre. So therefore, the animal's ability to harvest goes up. Yeah. Now, as I said before, if that's in a critical window, that's very beneficial. If all the if all the gib acid's done is push height up and hasn't increased ma mass much, you've got some benefit, but they'll chew, chew through the better quicker. Hmm. Excellent. Thanks, Phil. Uh, this is a good question, and I think uh, I'm glad to come up tonight. Um, from Je Jeff. Jeff, uh, so I'm currently trail feeding merino ewes on pasture. Um, the, the ewes are in there 10 to the hectare, trailing out about 1.2 kilograms a head three times per week. Question is, how often should I feed? Would twice a week reduce the disturbance and still provide nutrition often enough? Um, I'm quite comfortable with feeding twice a week. Um, I wouldn't do, I wouldn't cut it down any less than that, especially with, with in, um, so I presume we're talking about after lambing. Yeah, look, you could do it. You could do it twice a week. Um, it, it cuts down. Um, the animals will work their way through that. And also, if in that process you also take some of the pressure off yourself, that's a benefit as well. Um, you know, there's, there's two things that need to be managed in this scenario in the present. One's the livestock, which everyone out there is trying very hard to do, but you also have to be mindful of yourself. And uh, moving from three to two is not going to make a radical difference to the stock, but if it helps you, it's worthwhile. Yeah, spot on. Thanks, Phil. Uh, uh, a question here from Will. How much does frost hurt pasture versus cloudy weather with no sun? What's best or, or worst? I'd much rather have a, a minus frosty start and sunshine all day than than no frost and cloud, thick cloud all day. Yeah. If you think, our pasture species have developed for frosts, and unless you're going to get up into the you know the high country and you you know once you start getting frosts above minus twelve, well, we can start getting some problems. But you know minus fives and minus sixes, the, the pastures are used to it. That's how they've developed. It's, it's not an issue for them. Um, you know, give me frost and, and ten hours of sunshine any day. Yes, what I'm talking about. A uh, question here from uh, Lachlan. Uh, thanks, Lachlan. What is the best time to apply gibberellic acid? How big should the leaves be? Oh, 
can I can I just pass? I'm sure Basil's um, presentation would have done a better job than that. It's it's leaf area. It's the leaf area overall. Maybe not so much the the size of its leaf itself. Um, um, yeah, that's fair. I think that's the critic. Yeah, I'll leave it at that, Dave. Thanks. Yeah, refer to Lockie, please refer to Basil's webinar on the Making More From Sheep website. Um, when is the best? Uh, no, when applying nitrogen, don't you need moisture from Jen? Thanks, Jen. Um, yes, you do, but just bear in mind that at this time of year, um, if the ground's wet and the granule gets on the ground, it'll it'll just about dissolve. <laughs> From the moisture in the ground and even the dews overnight. So, you know, I'll put, I'll put urea out um, and there's been a heavy dew, and I'll come out the next morning and there's no sign of that urea. It's, it's, it's all been dissolved and running. Um, um, you know, if there's moisture sitting on the grass at this time of year, it, it, um, it will go into the soil very quickly. Phil, I will. Uh, I just want to, I've got a, a burning question that's on this nitrogen topic. And, and look, Basil did, uh, one of the key key points of Basil's presentation was that you, you, your planning window for the application of nitrogen needed to be quite long because if you left it too late, uh, which he thought he, he had seen quite often, uh, people get in a panic, they want, they understand that they've got no feed and and then they, they, they pull out all guns and, and urea is part of that, that arsenal. Um, his concern was that in some instances, that urea or that N was actually only contributing to a big spring growth and they weren't putting it on early, early enough to get themselves out of trouble in the winter. What's your opinion on when is it too late? When, you know, it's going to be uh, circumstantial for each different regions, but um, pick a location and say, when, when is it going to be too late? And it's only going to start to kick when the spring kicks anyway. Oh, Dave, I think you, I think I, I, I just spot on. I agree with Basil in, the, in that scenario. But, you know, if you, if you, like, to me, if you're if you're in trouble and you're thinking of putting it out on some selective paddocks, um, I think you'd be wanting to do an ASAP in in a month's time. I wouldn't be worrying about it. Um, you know, obviously, if you go a bit higher, you've got a little bit more time, but. Um, yeah, that's right. There's no point, no point putting the in. And I think it also comes back to the rate you're going to put out. Um, you know, there's no point, no point putting a massive amount out, which is really, you know, you just haven't got the growth now to utilise it. So that uh, big licks of in is going to come into spring. Well, I'm not interested in that. So um, I'd agree. Um, it's I think the windows, the windows sort of rapidly closing and. Um, I'd be going on. I'd be going for rates that are maybe a bit more on the conservative side than heavy side, because I'm just trying to get that kick. I'm really trying to get a kick over the next six weeks, and after that, I think the season's going to look after itself. Mm. So ASAP, or, or yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. And and the, and the other thing is, I think you need to be selective. You know, just don't just don't think, oh, well, I'll, I'll throw it everywhere. Um, you know, I've done over the over, over the years. I've put nitrogen on on paddocks where I have not been able to see a difference in growth. I see no visual difference in terms of colour, and I see no visual difference in growth. So if I'm not seeing that, it hasn't been a massive jump. Whereas I've gone to I've gone to other country, and you know, within five days of putting it out, you're starting to see the impact in terms of the, the colour change, and then the growth coming after that. So. I think you've got to be selective of where you spend it. It costs money. Um, yeah. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Phil. I, um, I've got a few other questions here. Just, uh, I'm just looking. We've probably got about another half a dozen questions and a few comments here. So, um, thanks for everyone for sticking with us, and I appreciate that some people might be needing to get off to bed. Uh, we still got 106 on the line, so we still got a, a big audience. Thanks, everyone. Um, um, don't forget that survey. If you are going to pull the pen and hit the hay, um, and don't forget to keep your uh, keep an eye on your email and text for that next webinar. It's going to be a cracker. And um, we've got Andrew Thompson and, and that, that the work that he's been doing, uh, lifetime you uh, work. Um, 
Uh, just a comment here. Thanks, Shane. Uh, tips to avoid lambs con contracting pink eye when supplementary feeding use upon lick feeders. Um, oh, sorry. No, it's actually not a comment. It's a question, I think. Uh, have you got any tips to help uh, uh, lambs avoiding pink eye when supplementing uh, uh, using uh, lick feeders? And, um, yeah. <laughs> Cool. Uh, yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, I was hoping it was going to be the tip. Um, <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 I haven't. Um, there are there are two different causes of two different organisms cause pink eye. So interestingly enough, on the southern tablelands, we get more problems with pink eye in winter for reasons we don't understand than. Um, Sort of the more conventional pig eye that's just the pig eye that's associated with dust. Um, no, I've got no, um, I've got no magical solutions there. Um, I'm afraid. Sorry, I can't help. No, for sure. That might be a question, Shane, to, to direct at your local veterinarian. They, they deal with this uh, quite often. Uh, question here from Ryan. So, if I first cross you with twin lambs. Has the DSE rating of 2.8 to 2.9? Does the DSE rating cover the ewe and the two lambs up until weaning, or do we need to account additional DSEs for the two lambs since they are also grazing prior to being weaned? From Ryan. No, that that figure I quoted covers the ewe for 12 months and the lambs up until weaning. So the, the, the lambs up until weaning is, is accounted for within that within the rating, and then once they've weaned, they become separate separate items. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Thanks, Phil. Um, a question from Kathy: For the punter, any suggestions for something to sow now for spring feed? Uh, rye grass question mark oats question mark something else question mark I don't know um, who the country is Kathy I don't know is it you <laughs> look look um, it's going to depend a bit a bit on on um, your environment and I'd be wanting to put a bit of thought into what I might be going to use it for um, those those two things mentioned rye grass oats. Um, you know, um, they can both go in there. They have the capacity to come up quickly. Um, but my thinking, if you're doing that, you're doing it on the basis that you're most likely going to graze those through and graze them out, or unless you're looking at maybe getting um, some fodder off it. Um, the other option, if you've got some country that's pretty bare and you're thinking of oh, maybe a, a bit further ahead, you know, maybe that country could be set up for something like brassica, which is going to give you food um, in that late spring, early summer window. So in most localities, there will be a range of um, things that you could sow, but I'd be doing it. I'd be doing it because I've thought through of where I want to use it. And, you know, where, where's going to be the best benefit? And then once you've decided where it's, how it's going to best fit into your your, your food plan, that would be to me determine what, what, you, what you, you sow. So I'd, I'd, I'd work that out rather than just say, well, I'm going to sow X. Yeah, right, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Hope that answers your question, Cathy. Um, now, this is a comment. Thanks, Ian. Uh, this gives you a break, Phil. Uh, Ian was particularly interested in Lana's comment around her use not uh, eating the winter active lucerne and just made a comment that maybe the lucerne at this time of year is unpalatable, it might have heavy nitrates, etc. lack of fibre, uh, maybe a lamb could add straw or hay, salt, mag, and possibly oats to, to, uh, to inspire them to eat it. Take a note of what other species they may be eating in between the lucerne and try opening the gate uh, to a grass paddock beside it to see, uh, to give them a free choice and, and obviously to see where they prefer to be grazing. So a few comments there, Elena, if you're still online. Um, it'll be interesting, yeah. Elena, thank you. Ian, thank you. Um, 
another David. Um, uh, it's about this trail feeding issue again, Phil, um, the frequency of it. What's your opinion of daily trail feeding? Will it lead to you being more comfortable with the process of trail feeding? Um, the problem if we go to daily daily trial feeding is that we tend to um, we'll tend to get a bigger tail. The more the more often we feed, we we tend to be favouring the, the the more dominant anim, animals in the mob and the animals who miss out are the, the, the less dominant ones. So um, that's the advantage of spreading it out a bit. Um, but I can see I can see the comment that I think the comment that you know if we're going daily it's it's you know it's, it's a routine I think to some degree that comes back to to how well people have, have managed their stock um, so if if they were really if if your stock were really comfortable with you and uh, you know you were able to do it quite happily I still would prefer to maybe do it two times a week than not to um, purely try and even the performance out. So it's one of the advantages when you get grow here is that you can remember things from days gone by and there was a lot of work done in Queensland um, a long time ago on, on drought feeding and the out of that work, so this was this was not pregnant animals, I just stressed, but out of that work, the best feeding regime was once a week. That left everything else that was better than feeding every day or twice a week. So, and and it was assessed on what was the overall performance of the mob. So that's the that's the issue. If we go too frequently, um, we favour the the dominant ones. If we haven't got enough self feeders in the paddock, the dominant ones will do very well, and the the less dominant ones will struggle. Yeah, really good, really good uh, question and great answer there, Phil. That's my my understanding as well. Is uh, yeah, the, the more frequent the feeding. It, it exacerbates or amplifies that shy feeding uh, phenomenon. So, yeah, very, um, very timely question. Uh, question from uh, Sefant. Uh, from Basil's webinar, he commented, oh, no, excuse me, this is a, more of a comment. I uh, think, Sefant. From Basil's webinar, he commented that gibberellic acid works better at lower temperatures and urea at higher temperatures. Thank you for that. Uh, some yeah, few comments here. Thanks, Phil. Great presentation. Um, uh, thanks, Phil and David. Thanks, all really good information. Thanks, guys. Uh, it's much appreciated. Um, one or two more questions here, and before before Phil's off the hook for the evening. Um, um, as pasture develop when the season breaks, uh, springtime. Should we be weaning gradually off pellets onto full pasture intake? As from Wayne and Wayne's up, up he's up towards uh, the Central Tablelands, Millthorpe area as well. Right. Yeah. Look, as far as the Raymond's concerned, um, there's not there's not really massive problems in going from our grains or pellets back onto pasture. You know, we have issues coming the other way, pastures on the grain. Um, what you're going to find anyhow is that the animals are gradually, will gradually be uh, changing the, the ratio themselves over time. Um, so when you get to that point where you want to back off, uh, some people will shandy it down over over a week. I personally, um, I, I just do it straight away. Um, it's you know they can they can handle it. It's not a major. Just remember the bugs in the room and change three times every 24 hours, so they have this enormous capacity to to readjust to um, any changes in diet. And, and pasture is what the room the room was built for, so it ends up changing to that very quickly and easily. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that, Phil, and thanks, Wayne, for the question. Uh, it looks like uh, the last question we have on the list at the moment, uh, Phil, and it's a good one. It, it's a little bit outside of the scope of of your charter tonight, but look, I'm sure you'll be able to contribute. Here we go. What's the best? Uh, this is from Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. What's the best grazing practice on perennial grass pastures, i.e., Coxfoot and Phalaris, come late spring, taking into account pasture persistence 
and also keeping pasture quality high. Are you better off keeping pastures grazed low for increased quality or shutting up a few paddocks to give summer feed even though quality is lost from Ryan? Well, I think Ryan to, to do one of those, the other one's going to happen. So if you're going to keep um, extra grazing pressure on, on some paddocks to keep a herbage mass down, which to me is a very logical thing to do, um, you do that, it automatically means you're going to have some other paddocks which you've got to get stock off and it's, it's going to get away. Um, I think the worst thing you can do at the end at the end of spring is to have all the paddocks on your property looking the same in terms of herbage mass. So you know you'll be you want to have some variety because therefore there's going to be different responses to uh, what summer ends up throwing to us in weather conditions, and it gives you as a manager some options of doing things and moving things around. Um, look, you can keep you can keep grazing pressure on paddocks to hold quality without putting those flares or coxfoot pastures under under pressure and what I mean there, look, if, if you're if you're grazing those pastures in a window of fifteen hundred to two thousand kilos, um, you're not you're not compromising the performance of that pasture, but you you're still keeping um, you're holding you're slowing the rate at which quality is disappearing and when you do leave walk away from that paddock, you're gonna have a paddock which hasn't got a great overburden and if seasonal conditions throw in the you know, a, a positive boomerang to us, that, that country's going to respond. So to me, it's, I think you can do both those two things. Um, you can achieve, you, you've, you've, you've questioned there, and I think it's it's a logical way. We want to try and, especially with young, uh, young lambs this year, if they've had it a bit tough during winter, we really want to um, keep our pasture quality and digestibility going as long as we can in the spring to, to try and get an extra three or four kilos on them just because we're grazing them on better quality. You know, once we get, once we get to about, you know, mid spring to me, it's, it's grazing for quality becomes the critical thing. And with young stock, they're the ones who benefit most by doing it. Yeah, okay, great question. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, we have had one more question come through, Phil. Uh, it's related to the once a week feeding. What's the max amount that you could feed out in the once a week feeding regime, uh, i.e., with barley? Um, well, if you went back to if you went back to this this uh, drought work, so it was it was a full ration, which was being being fed once a week. Um, so that would depend on the size of the stock, etc. But you would have been up over three kilos. But just remember to get to that once a week feeding, that would have been, it, there was most likely, there was most likely three weeks of training to get them out to that, you know, so it would have been the whole regime of, you know, starting off slowly, building it up and it would have got to, you know, three foods a week, then two foods a week, and then, and then they would have got out to one. So it's something that was done over, over a long period of time. It's something you just can't go to now. Would I go? Would I go to once a week feeding in winter time? No, I wouldn't, because you're putting a lot of grain out, and if the weather comes in, you could um, you could get losses. So I'd I'd most likely stay on two. Um, talking about the uh, scenario with with the, the uh, super spread, I know. I remember 20 years ago when I was in Western Australia, I was on this bloke's place, and he fed out. Over summer, he he spent one day feeding, putting out a month's food, was spinning lupins all over his paddocks, and that was that was his feeding regime, one whole day, and he put the food out for one month. Hmm. That's incredible. But he was he was where where he was, he was exceedingly confident he wasn't going to get water on to ruin it. Yeah, they are they are experts at summer summer and autumn feeding over there. Um, no. There's no more questions uh, from the audience, Phil. I might just take um, just take the opportunity to ask one quick one, and I think it would be of interest to a few of them. Um, is there any possible uh, persistence? You know, it, can we be doing any damage to our perennialty uh, through grazing through a tough winter like this? It's exceedingly hard to damage damage plants at this time of year. Um, the, the greatest damage we do to plants is um, in autumn and in 
perennial plants in autumn and in summers where we get on and off rainfall. We most likely do more damage in that sort of maybe January, February, a rain event comes in, we take all the green, it dries off again, another rain, we take all the green. That's most likely damaging plants more than, than what we're doing now. Um, we're certainly slowing them. So if we keep, if we keep uh, grazing the same paddock time and time again, we will, we will certainly hold growth rate back. But um, if you go and look at that paddock in early or late, late September, you might be very pleased how it sits. You know, some of the best, I see some pretty lousy paddocks which ended up being used as a, a sacrifice area and six months down the track, it was the best thing that ever happened to that paddock. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. But look, <laughs> I've been trumped. There's been one last question. We'll have to make this the last question. Otherwise, um feels good. Yeah, my bacon and eggs are getting cold. Your your your, your legs. <laughs> no, I said like I said the bacon and eggs are getting cold for breakfast. Yeah, yeah, we'll be we'll be we'll be there in a minute. Um Brian just asked what we're backing uh if you if you reduce your trail feeding frequency to once or twice a week, would that affect bacteria activity in the room? No. 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 Well, I suppose the the research might not have been a bacteria, but it it showed that it worked, eh? Yeah. Look, um, um, your obviously the, the feeding the feeding the feeding rate is going to be determined by what's the food in the paddock so you know if it's if it's only a small amount of food you need to put in as a supplement and you're feeding that twice an hour twice a week it's a small amount of grain going in the, the bulk of what's going through the room and will be will be pasture so that it's 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 driving all the time in a situation like right now the amounts we're feeding are much bigger so we're feeding twice a week, there's going to be a supply of grain which is going to be consumed over a number of days. Um, so that's 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 providing um, that's providing the resource for the room. Um, it's not as if they're not eating anything on on a on a day and that and it takes a while for things to process it. So there's there's material there for the bacteria to be working on. Um, um, that that rumen is an incredibly uh, dynamic organism. I go here, it's mainly out of the cattle industry. People talk about, oh, you get a dead rumen at the end of winter. The only way to get a dead rumen is to have a dead animal. Um, a rumen is never dead. Uh, there will always be biological activity going on there. And as soon as um, you put something in there, the food with which it will respond is incredible. It's the, it's the speed with which it responds when it starts breaking down rain that causes acidosis because it produces too much acid too quickly. Right? So it's a, it's, a very, it's a very robust organism which was developed by nature to handle a tough environment. So it's, it's the least of our worries in our production system, the ability of the rumen to handle things. Yeah, okay. 